Hi, and welcome to week five. I hope you all saw my announcement, uh, but this week, obviously, if you're watching this, and next week, I'm going to have to do pre-recorded lectures, and I will post them both Monday morning in the announcements. I'm so sorry for any inconvenience, but I want to make sure you get the material on Mondays, and Mondays just aren't going to be uh, able for me to work uh, for these next two weeks. After that, we'll be completely back to normal. So let's look at week five real quick. So um, we only have one discussion board this week. You're going to be turning something into a storyboard, and then next week we're going to be making it into an animatic. Um, we're going to look at uh, a few different things today. We'll get to it. <laughs> Let me just go one thing at a time. So for your discussion board, this one is due Sunday, so you have all week to do it. Because you're only having one discussion board, I'd like to see you really focus in on your storyboard panels and making them the best they can possibly be. We are going to be turning them into an animatic, so the better they are done storyboard-wise, the better your animatic is going to sell. So, today formatting and framing a project also may have to take into account mobile platforms and advertisements where things are uh, presented in portrait rather than landscape. So <clears throat> most of the time on your phone, you can do something like this. I don't know if you can actually see me tipping it, um, but sometimes it has to be in a portrait mode and you have to pay attention to the dimensions that you're given. Now, we talked about those kind of different types of storyboards and how you could make it wide open where you can kind of cut and frame it as you go. Sometimes you think one thing or a client tells you one thing and then all of a sudden they're like, hmm, just kidding, we're going to change it. So um, using your commercial, the project that was due Sunday, um, <clears throat> look at what changes you would need to make in terms of framing. We're thinking about framing and principles of design here. Um, how would you get the idea across without having to reshoot the project? Do a write-up, so write a paragraph, whatever it takes to describe the changes that you would make, and then draw over your storyboard panels. You could do this digitally, you could do it with a uh, colored pencil, whatever it is, but use a different color so that it really pops, and just draw right on top of it a square it will be, you know, a rectangle portrait way uh, to show how this would change. And then think about what information is the person missing? Would I need to add another frame? Does it sell the same? Anything like that. Okay. And then do Sunday. Um, using the script provided, develop a storyboard for the scene. Think about the pacing and the impact of the scene, what the viewer should get out of it. What are the directions the writer has given? What do they want to focus on? So this is Toy Story, get excited. Um, you can pick a section. Um, I would, if, if you can, I would like to see you do the whole thing. Um, if you feel like you can't do the whole thing and you need to do a section, please email me why you're just gonna do that section. Um, but all of the key things are here for you. Um, and I want you to know, I mean, most of I think, I think have seen Toy Story, but you don't have to do the characters the way that they look in the movie. If you want to, great. If you want to do a redesign, that is great too. Okay, so there's different things. You may look at this and be like, oh, is this a panel? Is this a panel? No, you need to think of it in terms of what do they need to see or what do you need to get across and then look at what you're given. Okay, and then long story short, do week six, we're going to turn it into an animatic. So I'm going to use After Effects for this course. Next week, I'm going to show you the ins and outs of how we make an animatic. It will be very um, software based. Um, please let me know between now and then if you don't have access to After Effects. Um, but this isn't our only animatic for the term. This is our first one of two. So we are going to be using this. I do want you to get comfortable with it. So again, don't hesitate and please message me if you have any questions. So I wanted to look at staging and composition really quickly. So composition refers to how the elements on the screen, uh, aka your character scenery props, appear in respect to each other within the frame itself. Okay. 
In the early days of cinema, film mimicked that of a stage play. Directors staged all the actors and important information to face the audience. We've come a long way from that, and knowing all of our technology and everything that we can do, there are a lot more options. Okay, so staging, an instance or method of presenting a play or dramatic performance. Composition is the arrangements of uh, into specific proportions or relations, especially in artistic form. So I have a few examples here. Um, so staging is placement, actors, cameras, and set pieces. Um, staging can make the visuals interesting or make them bland. So you can have what's called flat staging, where things don't appear to be as dynamic. Um, or you, you want to think about overlap. You want to think about the shapes your negative space is making. So looking at this one, the angles of the characters and their weapons are going back into space, and then we're seeing this character. It's really drawing your eye effectively, and then, of course, leaving your eye in the center for the next frame. Um, so here I thought was an interesting example as well. Um, All-nighter for a deadline. Okay. This has too much ambiguous focal points. So everything is kind of drawing your attention. I'm like looking at the guitar, which is leaning me outside. What's going on with these keys? Are they important? We can kind of see the clock. We see this woman working. Her garbage can is full, so she's obviously at a tough time. The better way to do this is to zoom in more. We still see this overflowing uh, garbage. We still see the clock. She's working hard, but we don't have all this kind of extra information that's distracting from the main perfect purpose. Uh, hand off keys to the car. Again, what are we looking at? The keys are very tiny. If we focus in on them that way, we can see it better. It's more dynamic. Now, of course, if you hadn't uh, set the scene, told us what's actually happening, if we never saw these characters before, you might go to this scene and be like, I don't know who that is. What are they doing? So, of course, setting up your scene first is going to be important. Now, um, I assume by this point you've looked at the elements and principles of design. If you have not, um, I highly recommend that you look. Um, you can just Google it. Um, but the elements of design are the parts that define the visual, the tools and the components that a person uses to create a composition. So the base of graphic design. The principles are how we can use those elements to create a visual, uh, to create visuals and convey a message. So, elements of design. Line. Okay, so just like we looked, where was it? I always have way too many tabs. So line. Having this, we're drawing line, we're actually doing a lot of things here, but line is drawing our attention through the piece. Most of the time you can have a horizontal or vertical line, but diagonal is going to bring the most attention and feel the most exciting of the three. Color, um, hue, saturation, and value, which is what the color is, how intense it is, and lightness and darkness. And again, if you don't know any of these, feel free to email me. We can talk about it more. I just wanted to revisit them. Um, so shape. Um, you can use line to create shape. They can be geometric, realistic, or abstract. Um, if you want to suggest femininity, for example, you can use curvy shapes. If you wanted a more masculine feeling, more angular shapes. So we can see we're using shape. We've got kind of a, a rectangle in the background. We've got triangle, circle, all to create some nice layers. Space. So white space or negative space the space between objects, how you balance them out. Um, symmetry, we have asymmetry and sy symmetry. Symmetry is if it's the same left and right um, or top bottom, kind of if you cut it in half. Asymmetry is when it is not an equal balance, but they actually weigh each other out successfully. So if I were to draw a line right down here, these are symmetrical on the left and the right. All of these things you can also use for visual hierarchy. So when somebody is looking at your piece, your, your composition, whatever it is, you want to tell them, hey, look here first, then go to this spot, then go to this spot, then come around back over here. So we use all these things to draw your attention and uh, move your attention throughout. 
So, uh, scale it refers to the size of an element in relation to another one. It can bring balance, proportion, and hierarchy into any design. Scale on this little tiny cart. Texture. Uh, surface quality of a design, it can be smooth, rough, glossy, etc., physical or visual. Um, makes things pop in your design. Can accentuate specific parts of the design as well. So principles, again, are how we can kind of use those elements in different ways. So balance, you know, things with symmetry or asymmetry, using scale, you know, if I have, we'll just use whatever this is. Um, if I have a big black circle, no, let me do that differently. If I have a small black circle, and a larger empty one, you may say that these balance each other out because this one is thick and heavy. You know, maybe I'd want it to be a little bit larger, but this one is empty and whole. You know, it, it's not filled, so it's lighter. Also, if I had this one up high and that one down low, depending upon how close, how far apart they are, all of that balance in your design. Contrast, when you want to emphasize key elements in your design um, and make it pop, using contrast is one of the best things you can do. Contrast help grab people's attention and generate interest in your visuals by making an object more distinguishable than the other. Okay, this pops, contrasting the red in the background. Repetition. So repetition can be boring and monotonous when there's no variation. When some degree of variation is added, then um, it changes everything. Repetition can be in colors, fonts, shapes, uh, all different types of elements. Emphasis is highlighting, again, telling the viewer where to go first, um, then telling them where to go second, and so forth. Um, movement, even though visual is static, it can still give the feeling as if the design is actually moving. For movement, you can use lines, shapes, edges, or color to direct the human eye. Unity, uh, unity is kind of like our, um, of course now I'm blanking on the word, continuity. <laughs> so how do all the different elements of your design come together to form a relationship? You've most likely seen designs that give you impression that the fonts and everything were chosen at random and that you don't feel like they all go together. Uh, and then rhythm. So same way spaces between musical notes create rhythm, spaces between design elements can create rhythm to a visual. Uh, flowing, progressive, random, or alternating. Regular rhythm is when the space between elements are the same. The flowing rhythm is going to give you a sense of movement through the curves and the bends. Okay. Again, just kind of want to get uh, base information for you here on the off chance that you don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm hoping that you do. All right, so I want to talk, we're going to talk about like five different random things today. Um, let's just do this. So a couple um, of commonly used camera uh, angles, camera from two shots. So not just one, but when you can use two to really seal a deal, sometimes it's more than two. Um, but what we can do, it's called a match Sorry. Wow, getting all spelling errors here. A match on action. Okay, so match on action. This is basically, you know, imagine the uh, the detective turning to you and saying, I know who did it. And then they 
reach up for their glasses and they pull their glasses off, right? What you can do is have that further away shot where they're, I've already touched my glasses and I'm pulling them off and then I cut to a close up and we repeat the action again. It isn't that you're going like back 30 seconds in time, you're just doing the action again. Um, so when matching action, you should only cut after the audience understands the visual information that's being delivered. If a shot is too fast, the audience will not have time to, to absorb the details. And if the cut is too short, the aud or if the cut is too long, the audience will be irked. Why am I watching this again? Why is this so slow? So it is a timing thing, and you'll see as we get into animatics, if you choose to do a match on action shot. Um, but it really seals the deal. So if you have a further away shot, you may not be focused on the character removing the glasses. And then when we match on action, aka repeat the action in the second frame, you'll be able to see them pulling the glasses off as the main focus. Um, sometimes this can be done too, again, with that creepy opening the door scene. So like the villain is coming up to the door, grabs the door and starts to turn it. And then we get that close up on the doorknob and the creepy hand of whatever monster is turning it. All right. Then we have an eye line match. So an eye line match creates order and meaning within the story space by matching eye lines between characters or what a character is looking at. If a person looks off the screen in the first frame, the audience will be expect to be shown what they're looking at. You know, so if I'm not necessarily breaking the fourth wall, but if I'm looking towards the camera and then I glance to my left off screen, make a crazy face, you as the audience are like, what, what are they looking at? What are they looking at? So you want to see what it is next. Um, just basically... Uh, giving your audience what they want. Um, all right. A cutaway. So the cutaway technique uh, can manipulate time and space. The cutaway should be related to the main action but not a part of it. For example, if two boxers are exchanging blows in the ring, you might cut to jeering fans or perhaps a vendor. Cutaways allow the director to make shifts in time. If a character is robbing a convenience store, for instance, a cutaway to the reactions of store patrons will allow the robber to have the money and be ready to make his getaway. So sometimes things might feel mundane or you don't necessarily want to pay for whatever it is. Um, like, uh, let's see, like a, a Disney, a Disney princess magical moment, right? Cinderella is in the blue dress or is in the cleaning clothes or whatever, and then she's magically in her blue gown, okay? So you could spend money, time, effort, whatever it is, to film her dress changing. But if you don't have the budget for that, you can always cut away. So we see her, oh, there's smoke coming around. We cut to the mice looking at her. We cut to, um, don't hate me, but her fairy godmother. I mean, maybe she doesn't have a name. Maybe just fairy godmother. Casting the spell, and then when you cut back to her, she's beautiful and ready for the ball. Or, you know, the example before. Let's say a character is watching a baseball game, and we're going to get through three strikes, uh, or three balls, and then the fourth ball is the the most important shot or whatever. Cut to a guy throwing a hot dog or whatever, and then you don't have to pay attention to the actual time it would have taken to go through those pitches. The cut-in or cut-ins? Uh, they focus on the primary action of a scene. Rather than cutting away from the main action, the cut-in shot narrows to view a smaller portion of the main action, providing emphasis. So if the main action is a baseball game, again, the cut-in could be the bat connecting to the baseball. The dramatic action of the bat hitting the ball is a, you know, having it be a smaller action uh, must match what is being shown in the larger scene. If it does not match, you'll have a jump cut, which... Um, 
the figure will appear to move, but the background does not. Um, for the Cinderella example, what you could do is do a cut-in of maybe a small, small portion of the dress or the dress having beadwork being added to it or something like that. All right. We have cross-cutting. So cross-cutting is called parallel editing. Uh, it can manipulate both time and space. So an action that is happening at the same time is an intercut, so the audience may see the parallel action. Generally, this is used to kind of intensify drama and provide suspense. Um, so like witnessing a scene of a bad guy about to kill his next victim as the hero is racing to the hideout. You know, I immediately kind of think of Dark Knight, but now that is kind of getting a little bit outdated of a reference. Um, but two independent scenes that are happening at the same time, and you as the viewer, you don't know the exact timing. So is the hero going to get there before the match lights and all the gasoline gets on fire? Or, you know, the old school kind of woman tied on the train tracks, the train's coming, and the hero's riding in on his horse. Will he make it in time? And then you as, you know, the creator can end the timing to see with what happens. Okay? All right. So we're going to look at transitions next. Um... We've got some pretty commonly used ones and then ones that are a little less common. So, um, fades. Fades are very common. So the, they're the building blocks of many other transitions as well. They're subtle, almost to the point of being invisible. Kind of, again, if you imagine blinking your eyes, it's just opening your eyes for a fade in. Um, important to think about, though. So during a fade-in transition, the shot gradually becomes visible, helpful in giving the viewer time to take in an image. Generally, these start at the beginning of a film or a scene. It's kind of weird to have a fade-in otherwise. Opposite, fade out. Uh, start at full brightness and becomes invisible. Using a fade-in and fade-out together is a, an effective way of um, passing time. Um, I'm going to show you in After Effects. I'm not going to go over the specifics of how to just yet, um, but just so we get an idea, I just have two frames from a storyboarding book. By default, when you just put one frame next to the other and we go through, boop, that's a cut. We talked about cuts before, um, but cuts are the most common transition used. Um, over 90% of films are used with cuts uh, to transition to connect shots together. Most audiences don't even notice when a program cuts um, because it is so fast and generally the storytelling is done at least somewhat successfully. Um, you don't even notice it's happening. You really have to pay attention to cuts to even see that they are happening. Um... You can also use cuts to compress time. Uh, so like a four hour wedding could be compressed in a minutes just with using some cuts. Um, fades, as we talked before, these are just transparency things. So if I start with the opacity at zero and then I move it to 100%, that's going to be a fade in. Now we have fade to black or fade to white. Um, depending on what your background is. So I'm just going to do black for the sake of what we're doing today. Um, so fade in. The opposite, of course, is a fade out. So where you go from 100% opacity to zero. So fade in, cut, fade out. Um, 
Again, it generally denotes a passage of time. Um, they're very subtle for the most part. You don't want to have this last forever. What I have here is a pretty fast fade, um, but depending on how long your shots are, that might be fine. Um, most of the time, fades to black. Again, if it fades to white, it's called a whiteout. Um, Fade in can ease your audience into a setting by starting out in black and then gradually lighting up the scene to full brightness. Fade out is usually the last shot of the scene that gradually disappears into darkness. Helps when you're changing locations or making a big scene change because it kind of eases us out of one, gives us a breath, and then we come in to the next one. Um... We can use fades um, to do kind of a cross dissolve. So remember I have a fade in here and a fade out here. If I actually switch them, just saving me from doing more editing, I'll just bump this over here, we have a cross fade. So we have this as that fades out, the other one fades in. Let me make this a little bit longer so you can see it a little bit better. Okay, so instead of going to black or white, um, you're going from one frame to the other. Helps relate some scenes to one another. Um, See if I've got the oh so fade and then um, wash would be to white so the cross dissolve here building on fades dissolve transitions usually replace one image with another but often with more artistic flair with this power becomes responsibility and complex dissolve transitions should only be used to aid in storytelling um, Combining a fade in and fade out, the cross dissolve gradually replaces one image with another. It implies passage of chime, time or change of location. Now, we have this ripple effect. Um, again, I mean, like Star Wars uses a lot of interesting effects. Wes Anderson uses a lot of interesting cuts. Um, you have to have reason. I mean, the ripple dissolve is definitely the default coming back or going into a dream. Uh, but just use sparingly. So jump cuts, we talked about the base cut. A jump cut is when you're keeping the same kind of character focus, but they're moving around. Um, it just makes it look like the character is jumping from one location to another. Helps show time passing. So, you know, if, if someone's waiting for their phone to ring or whatever the scene is, and you see them on the bed, you see them laying on the floor, you see them in the chair spinning around, jump cuts are the way to do it. A cutaway involves cutting to a secondary but related shot, and we talked about the cutaway earlier. Wipes, the so wipes are, they function the same way as a cut. Um, it basically one pushes the other image off the screen. Again, think Star Wars, iris in, iris out or the, um, like, um, I think just the standard wipe where, uh, let's see, where this frame, let me delete these keys, where this frame Sorry, hold on. This really isn't even worth creating, but we'll show you the wipe anyway. So where this frame slides on in and pushes the other one out. You can have it where it actually affects 
this bottom one and you have that one moving off as well. Again, think of your purpose while you're doing this. Um, yeah. So again, I, I like to show you just multiple visuals to make sure you understand. But fading in from black, fading out, wash out is going to white, cross dissolve from one frame to the other, ripple dissolve, again, you need to kind of think of having a reason for it. Cut away, jump cut, the wipe. Oh man, yeah, you can get crazy with these. So going from the corner up to the edge or circling around, I mean, transitions, you can. I mean, if you have a style and a reason, then go for it. Slide. I guess I was doing more of a slide than the wipe. Iris, circle. Morph, uh, you can kind of cross dissolve um, to a new version of the subject. Okay? So, with your um, Toy Story storyboard, I do want you to be thinking about all of these things. Now, we haven't talked about color yet. Um, we are going to be doing that as we move forward, but what I do want you to think about a little bit more is shading. So, generally, sorry, this is from a book that I took a picture of and then I took a picture on the computer, so I apologize for the quality, but you get the idea. So with shading, obviously we have the color of the paper being white, might not be a pure white by any way, shape or form, we have white. Then you wanna kind of break it down into four different levels of darkness, okay? A lot of times when we're shading, we just kind of are like, okay, let me outline everything, I got that, let me come in and bring in the black. So bring in A. And yeah, I mean, that does create shadow, but everything else that you have there is in highlight now. Because remember, shadow and highlight are best friends. They go together. So really, you know, this kind of one here is going to be your mid color. Lighter, and then the pure paper is going to be highlight. M you know, your mid dark and then the darkest. We're trying to create contrast in your frames, which creates depth. Okay? So for instance, Here's this koala bear, um, kind of an outline, probably what most of the storyboards have looked like so far, which is totally fine. But then thinking about these different levels of gray and how we can kind of affect it. Now, this can be very sketchy, again, because we only have one discussion board. I do want you to really think about these panels and try to make them neat and interesting. Um, if you are gonna hand draw them on paper, um, I would try to make your boxes a little bit larger. You can download different storyboard panels. Um, you can use the one from week one or two, um, but we're gonna need to bring them into the computer. So you're gonna need to take some pretty close up pictures of them. I would recommend if you want to do that, do the main kind of outline or sketches on the paper, scan or take photos of them, bring them in to any, whether you like Photoshop, Illustrator, Procreate, Paint, whatever it is, but make it digitally so that we can focus on like a 1920 by 1080 uh, dimension. Okay? So, also with these tonal values, remember we're thinking back to the principles and elements of design. We're creating depth, we're kind of using color, um, we're telling the viewer where to look, we're giving uh, more dynamics in each frame. Okay, so that's all I have for this week. Get started on your Toy Story storyboard. I generally, again, this is my process, you don't have to do it this way. I would write out, like I would probably print out <laughs> the script and then I would kind of bracket where I thought frames would need to be and I would kind of do a brief like just written out or sketch whatever you prefer as to what would be in the frame and then I would kind of look at my notes to see if that tells the story successfully then I would go get the panels and draw them out okay so again thinking about some lighting 
with our shading, thinking about transitions between the frames, <clears throat> thinking about the angles of our shots, um, everything that we've looked at, the 180 degree rule, perspective in the frame, your principles of design, how are you gonna overlap, how are you gonna draw attention, where should the viewer look first, and then um, continuity. And if I'm looking at this bear right here, when we go to the next frame, the attention should start here and then can move, okay? So feel free to reach out if you have any questions throughout the week. I am here. Um, if not, I look forward to seeing some Toy Story storyboards.